Hello and a very warm welcome to the channel. Now I've got another American history video for you today. It is about an event I've been meaning to cover for some time. In fact, since I first learned about it in any depth in a previous video. So it's the Battle of New Orleans, which took place in 1815, part of the War of 1812. It was I, I, actually it took place after the war had officially ended. There had been a sort of a peace treaty, but it took a long time for news to cross the Atlantic. It was, it was probably the most iconic battle of that war. It was a crushing British defeat, but oh, the, the good guys can't always win. <laughs> no. I, I don't think there was a good guy in the War of 1812, but if there was, it certainly wasn't the British. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I know a little bit about it. I, I know, obviously, I know the Americans were commanded by Andrew Jackson, who would go on to become president. I think this helped launch his political career. But I, I really want to know more. So without further ado, let's watch the video, which is from Kings and Generals, a great channel, and I'll put a link in the description. Kings and Generals. While British historians often view the War of 1812 as just one theatre of the larger Napoleonic Wars, okay. it stands alone as a conflict in both American and Canadian history. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is it played a quite big role in development of American and particularly Canadian national identity. And it particularly kind of solidified those as, as being distinct from one another. Um, so it, it, it strengthened the divide between what is now Canada and what is now the United States. Its most famous battle, the Battle of New Orleans was also its last yes. and featured one of the most important American military leaders, Andrew Jackson, who led an outnumbered... And for a long time I got this guy mixed up with Stonewall Jackson and I'm now very happy to, to confirm they're different people and not just one super, um, super long-lived guy who just kept changing sides. ...and undisciplined ragtag force against the world's strongest military. But, I mean, that, that might be a bit of a stretch. Um, I mean, in terms of army, I'd have thought Prussia or Russia or Austria would, would, would give the British a good match in, in 1815. In terms of navy, though, the, the British certainly have it in the bag. So, I mean, may, maybe overall, maybe overall they're right. And, of course, there was a naval component to, to the, the Battle of New Orleans. So, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give this to him on points. <laughs> I'm, I'm being picky. Having been at war with Napoleonic France for a long time, Britain started pressing American merchant sailors into service, yeah. forcing them to join the Royal Navy. The burgeoning United States considered this illegal and threatened no to surprise. But as Britain need <laughs> So the British defence was always they were chasing British deserters who were dead, who, who kind of left Royal Navy ships and gone to American ships. And there's probably some truth to that. I'm, I'm sure there were a lot of British deserters. I mean, if, if I'd been on a British ship in 1812 and I had the choice between fighting Napoleon <laughs> or, uh, or going on to an American ship, I think I'd probably do the latter. But in, pra but in practice, I'm sure they also seized a lot of American-born sailors. I mean, obviously, nationality wasn't quite as easy to define in those days, um, which, which understandably caused a lot of anger in, in America. Needed these sailors to reinforce a blockade of France, the practice continued. Hmm. Both that and the blockade of France had a negative effect on the American economy. Yeah. Meanwhile, as the Americans expanded westward, they faced Native American nations who ah. fought back. So I, I knew we'd we cover this in other videos, but I still can't get my head around the Louisiana Purchase. I mean, it was just such an amazing deal from the Americans' point of view. I mean, I say the United States nearly doubled its territory. Um, I mean, I, 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 perhaps it was because the territory was very sparsely populated by the French and had the French not sold it, the Americans probably could have seized it by force. But I, I, I still think, like, wow, what a deal you guys did. <laughs> ...to defend their land. The British became allies to these Native American nations, seeing them as a buffer to its Canadian colonies, and provided them with weapons. As attacks on American settlers on the frontier increased... And it, it seems if, like throughout the history of uh, North America, so from the kind of... The, the 16th century to the 18th century, it does seem that Native American tribes were often used as kind of proxies of different European powers. I mean, not, not just that they sided with different European powers in, in the actual major wars, and, and what was say European powers, including kind of European origin power of the United States. But the, even when the European powers were at peace, they were often used by one to kind of undermine the other by, by arming um, the Native Americans or, or arming one tribe or another. So it's, it's really interesting political dynamic. More and more of them began to blame Britain. Fair enough. 
American war hawks proclaimed the need for the new country to defend its national honor. Hmm. On June 4th, 1812, Congress declared war on Britain. And despite the fact many New England representatives strongly opposed the war, on June 18th... Yeah, I, so I'm not... I might be getting this mixed up, but I heard there was a lot of discontent and possibly even sort of rioting in New England because um, they had very strong trade links with the UK and they, they, they really didn't want to, to start to start a war. I, I, I'm not totally sure that, what the extent of that was. I think this video hints at it as well, but that would that, be very interesting to know. President Madison signed the declaration. Ooh. Britain was caught off guard by this as their forces in Canada were not prepared and the country mm. was mostly preoccupied with the war in France. Sure. Luckily, so that, that, that's the very important context. I mean, from a British point of view, the War of 1812 was always a, a sideshow to the Napoleonic War. Um, I mean, the Napoleonic War was seen as a kind of battle for, for national survival. The War of 1812 was an important conflict, but very much secondary to the, the struggle against France. For the British, the American forces were not prepared either. In 1812, yes. <laughs> the United States had an army of less than 12,000 soldiers. Oh! While Congress had approved the expansion of the army up to 35,000, service was voluntary, the pay was little, the army had few experienced officers, and many did not want to join because they didn't support the war. Oh, right. Oh, so this, this is the kind of the New England thing They were again. the first to attack, assuming Canada would go down without much of a fight. Michigan's territorial governor, William Hull, led American forces into Canada, but mm -hmm. mostly fought with words rather than artillery, <laughs> threatening the locals with a proclamation that stated that they must surrender or the horrors and calamities of war will stalk before you. <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, I mean, I'd be convinced if, if I was in Canada at the time and I was a British officer, yeah, I surrender. Th those are very impactful words and also I don't want to fight. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, 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 you might need slightly more than that, America. However, on August 16th, British and native forces led by Isaac Brock and Chief T. Kumsa of the Shawnee Confederation attacked Hull's forces at Detroit, forcing oh. him to surrender without firing a shot. Oh, wow. I did not know that. The War of 1812 took place in three theatres, the Great Lakes region, along the East Coast, and in the South. The Americans found little success in all three theatres. In the Great Lakes region... So uh, my understanding is that the initial um, American attack was quite... Because oh, the, the Americans had been hoping to, to, to take Canada, and the initial American attacks were quite unsuccessful. But they were only really facing Canadian militia and um, some kind of very much second-rate British troops. I mean, at, at this point, the best British troops were fighting Napoleon in Europe, but w w which makes the, the defence of Canada more impressive. But it also means that the, by the time of the Battle of New Orleans, when they were fighting much better British troops, the kind of the, the, the cream of the crop who had been fighting Napoleon, it makes that battle, look, that, that American victory, look more impressive by contrast. After Hull's embarrassing defeat, his replacement, William Henry Harrison, struggled to defend the few frontier out. And isn't it he? So William Henry Harrison, I, I think, uh, please, please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, I think he was the, 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 the shortest serving president of the United States. He became president um, and then died literally like a couple of weeks after his inauguration. If, if I'm wrong, I'm horrendously embarrassed and Americans, please do correct me in the comments, but I, I think I've got that right posts constantly under threat from both Native American and British forces. Ah. On the northeastern border with Canada, American General Henry Dearborn struggled to prepare an attack on Montreal due to the New England militias not wanting to fight in the war. Oh. Whenever American forces did cross the border, they were often pushed back. Yeah. Dearborn was replaced with Generals James Wilkinson and Wade Hampton but their complicated invasion plan of Montreal completely fell apart in November 1830. So one thing I find really interesting about the War of 1812 is that um, when the Americans invaded Quebec, or, or the French-speaking part of Canada, they got quite a hostile welcome. And, and you know, traditionally, for, for hundreds of years, there's been a huge amount of antagonism between the French and the English. So you, you might have thought that the French settlers in Quebec would, would leap at the chance to be freed of British rule. 
Um, but but they but they weren't for some reason. They they, they actually stuck with with the British. And I don't totally know why that is. I mean, maybe they thought their culture and kind of identity were better preserved within the British Empire than they would have been if they were subsumed into the United States. But I again that that that's something I'd love to know more about. And if if you do know more about that, please do comment below, and I will definitely check that out. Dean. Out west, though, American luck had begun to change mm. as General Oliver Hazard Perry was able to capture Lake Erie in the Battle of Putin Bay, fought on September 10th, Quite a name. This paved the way for General Harrison to take back control of Detroit, okay. defeating Major General Henry Proctor and his British and Native American forces at the Battle of the Thames on October 5th, 1813. Tecumseh was killed during the battle and oh. completely demoralized his Shawnee Confederation. In the South, influenced by the resistance of Tecumseh and his Confederation, Native American forces continued to build up, uniting oh. to fight the American forces. So I don't know if they were in any way um, like speaking to the British, so the, the, the Creek by the sound of things were, were speaking to the British. Um, or kind of, they, I'm assuming they must have known that America was engaged in, in a big war with a European power. Um, whether they were speaking to to Kumsa and his people at all, I don't know why. Because you know, for, for communications in those days would be really, really difficult. Um, but it's, it's a fascinating question. How how much did the Creek know about what was happening much further north? The main conflict became known as the Creek War, led by a traditionalist faction of the Creek Nation, known as the Red Sticks. Ultimately, American forces led by General Andrew Jackson defeated the Red Sticks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in present-day Alabama on March 27, 1814. This ended the Creek War. Okay. So now the Americans can send their troops Meanwhile, north. along the East Coast, the British Royal Navy was dominating. Throughout the war, they had set up a blockade from Maine all the way down to Georgia. In April 1814, after Napoleon went into exile, Britain was able to focus more on defeating the Americans, sending yeah. thousands more troops to North America. British forces, led by Major General Robert Ross, took over Chesapeake Bay and took the U.S. capital, Washington, on August 24, 1814, famously burning government buildings like the Capitol and the President's home to the ground. So obviously that's the White House being burnt. My understanding is that the British suffered higher casualties from a storm that happened just after they attacked Washington than they actually did um, for, on, from the attack on Washington itself. There, there was also a, a battle um, before the sack of Washington, which the British won. But yeah, my, my understanding is that they suffered worse casualties from a, a storm, maybe, maybe almost like a hurricane, uh, which, which hit after the battle. As Americans fled the capital, troops gathered at nearby Fort McHenry to attempt to defend against any further British advances. Okay. During the Battle of Baltimore in September 1814, American forces held back both sea and land invasions by the British, killing Major General Ross in the process. Ooh. This resistance... I mean, that's, that's an interesting point, because, like, quite a lot of... I mean, I mean, compared to nowadays, um, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking back in particular to the French and Indian War, Seven Years' War, and the Battle of Quebec, where James Wolfe and the French commander were killed, because we, we did that a couple of videos ago. Um, it does seem that in this time period, generals died quite a bit, whereas kind of in, in the contemporary era, I mean, like, you know, General Petraeus is, is very unlikely to be killed, especially now he's, I think, retired. Um, but it's very unusual in kind of modern warfare for, for a Western commander to be killed. Obviously, that was not the case during this time period. Eventually inspired Francis Scott Key to create a poem, which later became the lyrics mm -hmm. for the Star Spangled Banner, Beautiful. the national anthem of the United States. Mm -hmm. By this time, I, sh I shouldn't be doing that, but... ...were already underway in the city of Ghent in modern-day Belgium. Mm -hmm. On Christmas Eve, 1814, a deal was struck to end the war. However, the news of that would not reach America until a few weeks later. And the the, the, the treaty in Gwent, it, it basically just was, sorry, God, not Gwent, Ghent. It basically just restored the status quo. Uh, I mean, neither side really won anything from it. It basically says, back, back to how we were in 1812, we'll sort of try and forget this all happened. And British forces were well on their way to the city of New Orleans, 
a strategically important port city located where the Mississippi River meets the Gulf of Mexico. Capturing it would have allowed them to take over the Louisiana Territory. Britain had sent six So that's, that's really interesting because at this time, obviously, America only owned Louisiana for... If you look at the Louisiana Territory, I know it's a whole bunch of states now. It only owned it for a few years. So presumably it was very sparsely populated by Americans. Uh, and, and that made New Orleans so key. If, if, if you take New Orleans, you don't just get New Orleans, you get a huge swathe of territory further to the further to the west. And that, that that's something I'd never really considered before. It wasn't just a battle for New Orleans, it was a battle for, for a lot more territory than that. Um, and obviously, if, if the British had managed to, in some way, seize um, Louisiana, or what, what was what was gained by Louisiana Purchase, they could have kind of smothered the United States um, almost at its birth. 60 ships with approximately 14,450 soldiers and sailors aboard. That's a lot of guys. Command of Admiral Sir Alex Cochrane. <laughs> On the other side Great name. was Andrew Jackson, who by this time had become one of the most successful, if not the most successful, American leaders. I'm just going to pause it because I'm I'm really curious. This looks like um, like Napoleon Total War or something like that. Empire Total War. I don't know what that flag is. Cause I, these must be the Americans, but I, I would have thought they would have the um, some kind of stars and stripes. But they, they've got this sort of blue flag. So I, I, I don't know what that is. If anyone knows, um, please comment below. Maybe, maybe it's just a regimental flag, but there seems to be quite a few of them. I, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. When he had first arrived to New Orleans, he found the city completely defenceless. Ah. He immediately declared martial law and collected civilians to garrison the outskirts of the city. Okay. The army he built was mostly made up of untrained militiamen and volunteers. It was a ragtag bunch which included free blacks, New Orleans aristocrats, and members of the native Choctaw Nation. Oh, his troops were so diverse. That is very impressive. Um, I, I almost feel like there should be like a movie about that, or like a Netflix series or something. I think it'd be fascinating. Also, it's really interesting that. Obviously, this is a big American victory, um, but the American troops it seems they were very raw. A, a lot of them hadn't fought before, whereas they were going up against very experienced veteran British troops. So, I mean, you would have fought before the battle, but the odds were even more in the British favour than perhaps kind of the numbers suggested. First, that orders had to be given in English, French, Spanish, <laughs> and Choctaw. Yeah. The night before the peace treaty was signed, Jackson led his 2,131 men in a surprise attack on the so British that's, camp, that's nine not... miles south of New Orleans. So it seems he was quite badly outnumbered, because I, I think they said there were 14,000 British troops on the ships. I, I don't know if they all landed, if, or, or if some of them are still on the ships, um, but I, I, I assume there were more than, was it 2,500 or whatever it was, um, British. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's quite a difference. The unwitting British troops managed to fight off Jackson's forces, but 46 of their soldiers were killed, with 167 wounded and 64 missing. Jackson's attack had shocked them. They expected a quick victory with their superior, experienced forces, but everything looked more complicated now. Yeah. The British responded with a sortie on December 28th and an artillery bombardment on New Year's Day. Both failed due to successful American counterfire. By the early days of January, reinforcements had arrived for both sides, with the British soldiers now over 8,000 strong and Jackson's troops numbering 4,732. That's very precise. And, I, and I'm very glad they had that number. If, if, if it had been 4,731, God knows what would have happened. So that, that, um, that, that, that extra man made all the difference. Jackson's men built up fortifications near the Rodriguez Canal, okay. which branched off the Mississippi River and was about five miles south of New Orleans. Jackson used slaves to widen the ah. into a defensive trench and used the extra dirt. To so I mean, obviously it's, it's always horrible when you hear what was happening with slavery. Um, although, although clearly at this time, this was before the British Empire abolished it, so I mean there would have been slaves on both sides fundamentally. Um, I, mean, you, I, 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 I think sometimes if, if you were captured um, by one side or the other, they might then free you. But it, I mean, otherwise, it, it was yeah a, a grim time to be an African American still. Build a seven foot tall rampart supported by timber. This barrier, nicknamed Lion Jackson stretched from yeah. the Mississippi to the marsh, which was next to impossible to get through. 
Jackson. That's that's the, that's really interesting. So basically, the, the British have to attack on what is quite a narrow front because um, they've got the Mississippi to to their left, and they've got this in, kind of impenetrable swamp to their right. Um, so they, they have to attack the, fortif- the fortifications head on. They don't really seem to have much choice. That 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 that, that I think is probably going to turn out to be quite key. He told his soldiers. Here we shall plant our stakes and not abandon them until we drive these redcoat rascals into the river or the swamp. <laughs> Despite the quite imposing the fortifications, the confident British Lieutenant General Edward Pakenham planned a two-part frontal attack. The first part involved a small British force crossing the west bank of the Mississippi and taking over an American battery. After getting those guns, the plan was to turn them on the Americans, catching the defenders in a barrage of crossfire. Ah. The second part involved a force of 5,000 men charging forward in two columns to overwhelm the main American line at the Rodriguez Canal. So it's, it's interesting that the British were hoping to capture American cannons and then use them against the Americans. I mean, so during this time period, one of the kind of the, the, the really important things to do was if, if you lost guns, if you lost cannons, because cannons were so important, you'd, you'd spike them, drive a spike through them, which would then kind of um, result in them not being able to be fired at you by, by the enemy who's then captured them. Um, but I mean, I, I, I presume the British were fairly confident that the Americans wouldn't have spiked the guns. Seeing heavy fog on the morning of January 8th, Pakenham decided that this was the day to execute his plan just before dawn. Makes sense. His main force charged towards the canal near the swamp. They were met by shots from Jackson's 24 cannons. Along the riverbank, Colonel Robert Rennie advanced his forces, dominating an American redoubt. But before Rennie could claim victory, however, he was shot dead and his men frantically oh. retreated. Unluckily for the British, the fog quickly lifted giving American gunners clear sight of the enemy forces. So it, it must have, I mean, like, we have so little understanding of the weather, even in the 21st century. It must have been an absolute nightmare in the um, in the 1800s. Like, trying, trying to plan a battle, um, seeing fog, and I think this is great, this is a perfect opportunity, I can advance, um, we can advance and not be seen, and then just suddenly it just clears, and you're sitting ducks for like, these huge rays of American artillery. It must have been um, something pretty terrifying. Cannon fire successfully split the British line in several places. Jackson's soldiers, many of them hunters of the frontier, ah. fired with stunning precision. Pakenham, who was up front with his forces, was a victim of that accuracy. Oh. So I mean, this is one of the advantages the Americans had in the um, Revolutionary War as well, was a lot of their, or, 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 or some of their militiamen were, were frontiersmen. Um, so even though they weren't really experienced in combat, certainly not in kind of European style line combat, they were very good shots. Um, and I mean, that, that, that made a difference in the Revolutionary War, and by the sound of things, it made a difference here as well. And died minutes later. The lead British commander on the battlefield was now gone as well. Uh-huh. Meanwhile, the British force that was supposed to take over the American battery was delayed. They captured it and were okay. mostly successful at taking out some American troops, but by that time it was too late. Uh-huh. At Line Jackson, the British soldiers were retreating in huge numbers. The British attack on Jackson's fortification. I mean, it sounds like the British just launched almost, I mean, except for this kind of little diversion um, where they attack the American gun emplacement and, and, and capture it. It sounds like the British base just launched this massive frontal assault on this very heavily um, defended American position, hoping the fog would cover them. The fog, the fog cleared, and then it was just a turkey shoot. That that's what it sounds like to me, uh, and obviously it would have been horrendous to be. I mean, on either side, but horrendous to be one of the soldiers advancing into kind of concentrated American grape shot, um, cannon shot, musket fire, um, and and suddenly having kind of no protection when the weather turns. Was a failure, and they had lost around two thousand men, including three generals and seven colonels. The whole battle that's lasted nasty. less than thirty minutes. Oh, Jackson's under- so that's really really quick. I mean that's like incredibly brutal, incredibly quick. Um, like, but, but, but you know, by, even by the standards of the time, I mean, usually battles would last a day or sort of half a day or so. So yeah, I mean, that, that it, it must have been incredibly intense for that half hour. The dog unit lost less than seventy men. Oh wow, that that is the impressive. The British army remained in Louisiana for several days. After its naval force failed to take Fort St. Philip on January 18th, 
the British had to retreat back to the Gulf of Mexico. Soon, uh, both sides had finally received the message that a peace treaty had already been signed. <laughs> so that, that's the ironic thing is, I mean, the battle was on one level completely pointless. I mean, it didn't change anything politically. The peace treaty had already been agreed. I mean, you kind of wonder maybe if the peace treaty hadn't been agreed, that would have then given the Americans some extra kind of negotiating advantage and extra leverage. Uh, but yeah, so from a political point of view, it was completely pointless. But it was obviously still very important from a kind of the, from the, from, from America, American prestige, um, especially after some of the earlier setbacks. The Battle of New Orleans was the final major battle of the War of 1812, yeah. and is often considered the most important battle of the war, despite being fought after a peace treaty yeah. was negotiated. The battle was significant for the Americans, as they were huge underdogs in Louisiana, and okay. expected the worst. This victory... And I guess this comes back to the point they made earlier about how it wasn't just a battle for New Orleans, because if, if New Orleans had fallen, um, because Louisiana was so sparsely populated, that the, the British could potentially have fanned out and taken you know, quite, quite a large amount of territory. So it, it wasn't just for New Orleans itself. Which kind of shows you why the stakes were so high. Raised the profile of Andrew Jackson, who was now a national hero. Future president! While most historians conclude today that the War of 1812 was a stalemate, mm. it felt like a victory to Americans after the victory at New Orleans. Mm. We are planning more videos on US and Canadian. So that that was fascinating. Um, I, I, I know a lot more about the battle now. I, I didn't realise the extent to which it was just a full frontal assault. Um, it sounds like the Americans had quite well prepared defensive positions and the British just charged at them. Um, and that, that weren't about as well, well, weren't, weren't as, as well as you'd expect it to go. But as I say, that's, that, that's been fascinating. Um, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it interesting. At, at the very least bearable, I, I will happily settle for bearable. And I hope to see you again for another video. Thank you very much.